So there you are. You have the rest of the day to yourself to start studying for your upcoming exam. So you brew a hot cup of joe, open up your computer, cue up some lo-fi study beats, and get right to work. Before you know it, you're in a group, fueled by caffeine and career ambition, plowing through lecture material like a freight train without brakes. You totally lost track of time because you're in a state of flow and you don't even realize it. Nothing can stop you now, except... Medical school is a huge adjustment to make for anybody. Trying to learn the incredible volume of information is like trying to drink water through a fire hose. It can demand up to 12 hours a day of deep work to retain the large volume of knowledge that you're responsible for learning. While consistent studying day in and day out is the bedrock of long-term retention, keeping yourself mentally and physically healthy is the bedrock of being able to stay consistent and to get the best long-term results from your hours of hard work. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about the science behind some of the most important habits that I developed over four years of university and four years of medical school to study effectively and consistently, get great results on my exams, and maintain my physical and mental health in the process. The first of these habits may surprise you, and it's taking breaks. Taking breaks is super important for learning. There's a mountain of evidence that your cognitive function is improved over a long workday if you take timely breaks. A recent study found evidence that the networks of brain cells used for learning are more poorly regulated than normal at the end of a long workday, but are actually better regulated in comparison during the same length workday that includes breaks. Taking breaks is not only crucial to preventing mental burnout, but actually actively contributes to your memory retention. Last summer, the NIH posted an article with some fascinating findings on the benefits of rest during the day. They found that taking short breaks is actually key to learning a new skill more efficiently. Using a highly sensitive brain scanner called magnetoencephalography, they discovered that during a break from active work, our brain unconsciously replays repetitions of the skill we were just practicing, whether that's learning a new instrument, doing new world questions, or smashing the Anki space bar. So your brain literally rehearses what you're learning while your conscious brain gets a well-deserved short mental vacation. One excellent technique for taking breaks that has really stood the test of time is what's called the Pomodoro technique. Let's say you plan to study for 12 hours. The Pomodoro technique would structure your study hours like this. First, you work for 25 minutes and then take a five minute break. That's your first Pomodoro. You repeat this for four Pomodoros, each for a total of a half hour. Then on your fifth Pomodoro, you take a long break for 15 to 30 minutes, kind of your choice. If you plan to put in a 12 hour study day, each cycle is almost three hours. So four full Pomodoro cycles would get you to 11.6 hours or almost 12 hours. I'll be honest, I tried the Pomodoro technique during my first year of medical school and it just kind of didn't work out for me. I still think it's an excellent technique for most people, but for me personally, I found that 25 minutes isn't always enough for me to take enough of a deep dive into the material to get the understanding that I need, especially the more complex concepts. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't give this proven method the old college try. Breaks are also known to boost creativity. In medical school, I experienced these as brief aha moments where I'd make surprise connections about what I was studying. In fact, during a break from writing the script for this video, I actually came up with some of the corny jokes and Easter eggs you'll see later in the video. So to wrap up the importance of breaks, just remember that your brain is a muscle and the gains happen during recovery. Which brings me to the next important habit to develop, and that's exercise. Your brain actually needs physical exercise to perform and learn at its highest potential. The exact type of exercise isn't quite as important as just making sure you keep your body moving on a regular basis. Human studies have shown that when we exercise, special proteins are released from our muscle, fat, and liver cells into our bloodstream. These proteins flow to the brain and stimulate the release of a protein called BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which stimulates the growth of brain cells and the connections between our brain cells in our brain's memory center called the hippocampus. This process is called neurogenesis and is known to improve our cognitive performance and memory function over time. In the book Spark by Dr. John Rady, he takes a deep dive 
into these benefits using several real world examples and studies, including school children who saw improved test scores after routine aerobic exercise. Spark is a book I highly recommend. I was lucky enough to read this early in medical school, so I put it into practice during my long study days. Between studying lectures or practice question blocks, on most days I took about 45 minutes to go on about a three mile run around my neighborhood. Rain or shine. I took a shower, changed, and got right back to work feeling physically and mentally refreshed. The next thing I had to get better at in medical school and be more disciplined with is sleep. Sleep is arguably the most important extracurricular activity for memory retention. For maximum health benefits, the National Sleep Foundation recommends seven to nine hours for anybody aged 18 to 64. And it's no secret that you really need those Zs to consolidate what you learn each day. Studies have shown evidence of two similar phenomena that can interfere with our memory during our waking hours called proactive and retroactive interference. The general idea behind this is that your brain is basically a 1 million gigabyte hard drive that can only hold so much information. Let's say today you study the enzymes of glycolysis and tomorrow you study the Krebs cycle. Well, tomorrow after you study the Krebs cycle, you might find it harder to remember the enzymes of glycolysis that you studied the previous day. This would mean that your brain was affected by retroactive interference. On the flip side, your brain's memory of glycolysis might have also affected your retention of the enzymes of the Krebs cycle that you just studied. This is called proactive interference. I feel like this describes the challenge of medical school at its very core, where a student needs to learn and integrate tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of medical concepts, facts, drug names, and terms. Fortunately, in this same study, they found evidence that sleep, including naps, rescue the brain from being affected by both these types of interference, essentially consolidating your important memories into organized folders. Interestingly enough, this benefit correlates with the amount of REM sleep that you get during the night. So since your REM cycle happens every 90 minutes while you're asleep, your brain's memory retention and organization benefits most from sleeping the recommended seven to nine hours. And in addition to getting those eight hours, maximizing the quality of your sleep is also important, but easy to do. There are lots of simple tricks that I've learned and still use to optimize my sleep and feel much more refreshed in the morning. Blue light from digital screens like your phone, iPad, or computer delay your natural circadian rhythm. But since it's virtually impossible for a medical student to put away their screens more than one to two hours before bedtime, at least for me, schedule your laptop to change its lighting to warm hues after sunset. I also use a pair of prescription glasses that have blue light filters. Any ambient light or sound in your home can also disrupt your quality of sleep, even after you're asleep and don't realize it. Before I go to bed, I wear a sleep mask to block out any light coming in from other rooms or the windows. An alternative to this, is blackout curtains, as well as just making sure all the lights are turned off. But a sleep mask is great if you have a roommate or partner who stays up later than you and needs the lights on after you go to bed. I also take melatonin supplements before bed, which is the hormone that controls your sleep-wake cycle. It definitely helps me feel more refreshed in the morning. But then again, it could be a placebo effect. Finally, if you're anything like me, you probably have a caffeine addiction, but I learned that cutting out caffeine after 2 p.m. improves the quality of sleep. It gives your body its best chance at quality restful sleep by your bedtime. The half-life of caffeine is about four hours. So if you have a cup of coffee at 2 p.m. that has 100 milligrams of caffeine and go to bed at 10 p.m., you'll still have about a quarter of a cup of coffee's worth of caffeine in your system. If you break the 2 p.m. rule and have a 6 p.m. coffee to get over your afternoon slump, then you'll have three quarters of a cup of coffee in your system when it's time to go to bed. Don't get it twisted though. Coffee is one of my staples for a productive study day, which is a great segue to my next important habit, which is diet. What you eat and drink has a huge impact on your cognitive health and function in the short term and the long term. The research on this is so extensive that it deserves a video of its own or 10, but we do know that there is a communication between your gut and your brain, both by hormones released into your bloodstream by your gut bacteria and the vagus nerves, which directly connect your brain stem to your GI tract. This connection is even implicated as a contributor to the development of your central nervous system. The jury is still out on all the precise physiology, but it's believed that as a consequence of this brain-gut relationship, Minimizing gut inflammation and irritation is associated with improved cognitive function. Diets that are low in saturated fats and rich in unsaturated fats and fiber, like the Mediterranean diet, can have these anti-inflammatory gut benefits that appear to be beneficial to your cognition and mood. The Mediterranean diet is based in whole grains, nuts, 
fruits and vegetables, olive oil, fish, and seafood. Studies have found it to lower metabolic byproducts in the blood that are seen with higher gut inflammation. In one six year randomized trial, people that were given the Mediterranean diet were found to have improved cognitive function than the control group. Another interesting up and coming area of research is the benefits of probiotics. I don't have any personal experience with this, but in my reading about the effects of diet, I found an article that taking a certain probiotic significantly increased the blood levels of BDNF, which is the same brain protein I mentioned before that helps grow your brain cells, enhance connections to improve your memory. They concluded that probiotics promote mental flexibility and alleviate stress in healthy older adults. I started to include some important parts of the Mediterranean diet into my own meals, like nuts, olive oil, and fish like salmon. I'm still working on the fruits and vegetable part. As for me, my personal favorite food in the Mediterranean diet is eggs. Not only is it an amazing natural source of protein, but eggs is one of the several foods in the Mediterranean diet that's rich in an essential nutrient called choline that your cells use for creating neurotransmitters and building the cell membranes of your neurons. This may be why dietary choline is associated with improved cognitive function and even lower risk of dementia later in life. The next super important and really underrated habit is to stay hydrated. We all know drinking water is good for you, but speaking for myself, knowing it's good for you is one thing and actually staying hydrated is another. When I study, I always have a bottle of water next to me and try to refill it at least twice a day. A recent study of college age students found that dehydration has negative effects on short-term memory, attention, and energy. On the flip side, rehydration improved mood, short-term memory, attention, and alleviated fatigue. So if you're on a long study session and you hit a wall and you feel like you have brain fog, the easy answer could be that you're just dehydrated. Personally, I noticed a boost in my mental clarity when I was better at keeping a water bottle at my desk and staying hydrated. That mental fog for me is one of the ways that I hit a wall and run out of mental energy or the quality of my work starts to tank. It's just a simple and easy way to keep yourself sharp, especially for long hours of studying. And the last good habit was optimizing my work environment. Taking the time to make sure your workspace is conducive to learning without distractions can skyrocket the quality of your studying. And the first of the ways that you can do this is by including natural light in your workspace. This could simply mean making sure you're studying in a room with windows. Once I made this change in medical school, it really helped boost my mood and energy for long study sessions. Sunlight exposure is actually correlated with increased concentrations of serotonin and that brain protein that keeps coming up called BDNF. So it boosts brain plasticity and your ability to learn. It also helps regulate your circadian rhythm, keeping you awake and alert during the day when you need to get your work done. You ever tried working in a dimly lit room? It always ends the same way. Also incredibly important is removing distractions from your work area. For me, this starts with my workspace being free of clutter. The fewer random objects I have on my desk or around me while I'm working, the better I feel like I can focus. Maybe this is just me, but clear space, clear mind. Also invest in a good pair of noise canceling headphones. I typically listen to lo-fi jazz or hip hop playlists that have no lyrics. Every time I give in to listening to my favorite artists while studying, I end up bopping instead of working. And disable all the app notifications on your phone that you can afford to ignore. Letting yourself get distracted by your phone lighting up with an app notification, a text message, or even phone calls is one of the easiest and most costly ways to get derailed from your focus. And I am as guilty of that as anybody. A famous study at UC Irvine found that after being distracted, it can take up to 23 minutes to refocus on your task. A standing desk for my workspace was also one of my best investments that I wish I made sooner. Sitting down for long hours is actually really bad for your health, especially if you don't do regular exercise. And at least for me, my body starts to feel like crap after sitting in one place for too long. With a standing desk, I at least have the option to switch back and forth from standing and sitting. Then if I get tired of standing, I just sit back down. I like it this way because I just feel like it gets my blood circulating better. And just one final note, don't forget that you're a human being. If you decide to make some of these lifestyle changes to help you study smarter, don't be too hard on yourself if you miss a workout or get distracted from studying once in a while. It happens to the best of us. Also, avoid all work and no play. Schedule a day off or a night off at the end of a successful week of studying to hang with friends, go on a date, or pursue your hobbies. You really need to reward yourself for all the hard work you put in. Hopefully the habits in this video can help you improve your study habits and improve your well-being in the process. So that's all I got, guys. I know that was a lot. So as always, if you have any questions or would like to hear more about anything I talked about, let me know in the comments. This one took a lot of research and browsing through PubMed. There's still a lot of gray area in all the research that I looked into, 
but it's really interesting stuff that I felt was really good to share. And at least anecdotally, I felt that these had a lot of benefit for me during med school. So I really wanted to share it with all of you. All right, see you in the next video.